If you've watched any American sports recently, there's a good chance you were blasted with an advertisement from FanDuel, DraftKings, BetMGM, and various online casinos promising you free money and million dollar jackpots upon sign up. But it wasn't like this years ago. Historically, sports betting and gambling in the US had been heavily restricted, where you could only legally play offline at isolated places around the country like Las Vegas and Atlantic City. Even the sports leagues themselves frowned at any mention or association with sports betting. But in the past five years, the landscape has evolved dramatically as venture capitalists have invested billions of dollars into mobile-first gambling startups like FanDuel and DraftKings. Despite the relentless advertisements, the widespread popularity, and the celebrity endorsements, online gambling and sports betting is nothing more than a wild west, where everyone claims to be a hero and no one is telling the truth. It's a market so new that every company boasts that they're the winner, they have the best apps, the most users, and the fastest growth. In this episode, we'll unmask the wild wasteland of online gambling in the United States, we'll cover the economics of casinos, the political dynamics behind this market, and what FanDuel and DraftKings are really betting on as they pursue adoption at every turn. This episode is sponsored by Kajabi, the ultimate all-in-one platform that helps entrepreneurs build successful online businesses by unlocking predictable, reoccurring revenue. The biggest challenge as a creator is making enough doing what you love. Having to constantly adapt to the YouTube algorithm, to stay ahead of copycats, to maintain compliance with platform guidelines, all while keeping quality, originality, and consistency is an endless battle. This makes depending on a single platform progressively dangerous for Modern MBA as we aim to create better content and to scale. As an entrepreneur, you work hard to build your brand and it's a lonely journey where you don't get a huge team to help you out. But that doesn't mean you have to do it all alone and give up a cut to a middleman. With Kajabi, you get all the tools to build your business the way you want and keep everything you earn. No matter your niche, Kajabi makes it easy to turn your skills, passions, and experiences into enriching online courses, exclusive membership sites, subscription podcasts, thriving community, personalized coaching, and more. The best part? Kajabi doesn't take a cut of your revenue because everything is owned and controlled by you, so you keep 100% of what you earn. And with Kajabi, you also get robust analytics, easy payment options, email marketing tools, and customizable website templates all built in. You don't need a huge audience to make sustainable income. There are thousands of creators on Kajabi making six and seven figures with less than 50,000 followers. Right now, Kajabi is offering a free 30-day free trial to start your business if you go to kajabi.com slash modern MBA. That's K-A-J-A-B-I dot com slash modern MBA, Kajabi dot com slash modern MBA, and join the creators and entrepreneurs who have made over six billion dollars. Since the 1900s, gambling in the United States has been intensely regulated. Initially, it was for religious reasons, as gambling clashed against Puritan ideals of honest work. But in modern times, the continued restriction on gambling has been for more sociological reasons, as measures to combat crime, corruption, and unproductivity. In the US, gambling is classified into multiple types, but for simplicity, we'll focus on the three most relevant to this episode. The first is sports betting, where you wage money on a sporting outcome, if a team will win, how much they'll win by, the final score, and even the performance of a specific player. Since sports is a competition of skill, it's possible to calculate probabilities by looking at on-field form, injuries, historical performance, and sentiment. Thus, in sports betting, every wager has set odds. This is why you'll always make more betting on the underdog over the favorite. In gambling, you'll hear people talk all the time about the house, which is the name of the entity or establishment that operates the game, that provides the means for you to place bets, that collects the money, and then pays out the winners. In sports betting, the house is called a sports book or a bookie. The sports book sets the odds, which in turn determines the payouts. The sports book has to make some profit to make facilitating these bets worth their time, so they bake in their profit margins into the odds. Think of it like a transaction fee, as sports books make money off of every bet, regardless of whether it wins or loses. And players bet against the sports book and not each other. Because sports betting requires knowledge of the underlying sport, it's legally considered a game of skill. The second type is paramutual betting, in which people bet against each other. The money from all the players is pulled together and there are no fixed odds or fixed payouts. In this case, the house pulls all the money together from all the bettors, it takes its cut as a transaction fee, and it pays out the remainder of the pot to all the winners. Examples of paramutual betting are horse races or poker. In paramutual betting, people play against each other, the house takes a transaction fee, and the size of the pool and the payouts are dictated by the players themselves. And examples of paramutual betting establishments are card rooms and racetracks. 
The third type is commercial gambling, which is that classic Vegas casino that you see in movies and TV with high rollers, high stake table games, wheels, lights, and huge payouts. Commercial gambling refers to slot machines, dice games like craps, wheel games like roulettes, and house bank card games like poker or blackjack. Commercial gambling establishments are known as casinos. Compared to card rooms, racetracks, and sportsbooks, casinos are the most lucrative type of gambling establishment to run. In commercial gambling, every game is designed to favor the house over the player, because casinos ultimately profit at the expense of their players. In commercial gambling, you play against the house, and the house only makes money when you lose. Most casino games are games of chance where your odds of losing are greater than your odds of winning. Even in games of skill like blackjack, the casino holds an edge of 1-2%. to This means that as a player, as soon as you play a hand, you're already at a disadvantage with a 48-49% to chance of winning. If you play enough hands, you'll inevitably lose money over time as it's mathematically impossible to win every hand. Even if you're hot, there are so many other players at different tables in the same casino that the house is still winning overall. If you play games of chance like roulette or slots, the house edge can get as high as 20%, hence the saying that the house always wins. And if you win too much, if you count cards, if you use technique over emotion, casinos can legally kick you out so they keep the odds of winning forever in their favor. In the United States, it's up to each of the 50 states to determine what kind of gambling is allowed, where, and by whom. With the house edge, commercial gambling is seen as the most sinful and predatory type of gambling. Casinos, by extension, are perceived as magnets for organized crime and contributors of poverty, greed, and degeneracy, things that no one wants in their community. Hence, to this day, casinos and commercial gambling are still banned in over half of the United States. Even states that have legalized commercial gambling try to concentrate the casinos to specific areas like Atlantic City in New Jersey or the Strip in Las Vegas to minimize their impact on locals. Yet the fragmentation goes a lot deeper than just the casinos. In California, for instance, sports betting and casinos are illegal, but racetracks and card rooms are permitted. In Texas, card rooms are allowed, but racetracks, casinos, and sports betting is illegal. And in Nevada, lotteries and racetracks are banned, but casinos are fair game. There's really no rhyme or reason as to what gambling is allowed in each state, as every state makes its own rules. But when there's money to be made, humans will always find a way to make it happen. Indian reservations are plots of land around the United States that are effectively self-governed independent nations that are free of American federal and state laws. This means that even if a state has banned casinos, it can't stop a Native American tribe from opening up a casino on its reservation even if that reservation is geographically located within that state because the reservation isn't legally under the state's jurisdiction. The lucrative nature of the casino business, the high demand and throttled supply of commercial gambling, and this loophole is why there are actually more Native American casinos than there are commercial casinos in the United States. But with the exception of Indian reservations, the states ultimately control what's allowed, where, and by whom. Gambling is a profitable, high cash flow business that sells itself, and there's no shortage of people that would leap for the chance to open up a casino, a card room, or a racetrack. But states deliberately restrict the number of gambling licenses and establishments allowed. That way, states can tax as much as they want, and the gambling businesses have no choice but to pay up, as they're the few lucky enough to even be operating at all. Every state taxes each gambling establishment differently. Even if you do get to open up a casino in a state where commercial gambling is legal, the state will take a huge chunk of your gross earnings, not just your profits. For instance, Delaware taxes every casino 57% of every dollar they make off of slots and then 20% off table games. For every $100 that someone loses playing slots in Delaware, the state immediately pockets $57 and the casino can only recognize $43 as its own gross earnings. Florida takes 35% for slots, whereas Rhode Island takes up to 74%. It's usually the flyover states that lack tourism and tax opportunities that are generally much friendlier to gambling businesses, like South Dakota, who taxes casinos just 9%, or Nevada, who taxes less than 7%. The tax rates change dramatically in sports betting, where states like Delaware, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire will tax sportsbooks 50%, whereas a flyover state in the Midwest will tax 20% or lower. These high barriers to entry, the heavy taxes, the physical isolation from society, and the restricted access are why online sportsbooks and casinos like DraftKings and FanDuel have become such a gold rush in the United States. The promise of software is scalability, flexibility, and access. 
On paper, an online gambling experience would disrupt the regulatory handicaps that traditional brick-and-mortar gambling establishments have faced for decades. With online casinos and sportsbooks, Americans would no longer have to travel to gamble when they can just place bets on their phone anywhere, anytime. Online sportsbooks and casinos would in theory pull in greater earnings as the number of games they could offer virtually would be infinite. In contrast, there is a cap to the number of players, slots, tables, and dealers you can physically accommodate in a casino. The profit margins should be even higher given that there's no overhead and there's minimal labor costs as you don't need janitors, security, bartenders, cashiers, servers, and cash counters to run an online operation. Best of all, you can serve multiple markets from a single point of entry. You don't have to be just a sports book or just a casino. You can offer whatever is allowed and make money in every state with your single virtual storefront. DraftKings and FanDuel have followed these advantages, expanding from just fantasy sports, then into sports betting, and now online casinos. But in order to understand why DraftKings and FanDuel are both struggling for profits in what should be a slam dunk business, we have to first learn about the traditional casino business and how they operate as a baseline. Despite the punishing taxes and regulatory handicaps, casinos are some of the most lucrative businesses in the world with profit margins greater than hotels, cruise ships, and luxury brands. With the limited access to high-stakes commercial gambling, casinos operate by the adage of if you build it, they will come. The most successful casinos in the world are American casinos like the Wynn, the MGM, and Caesars, whose properties in Las Vegas are recognizable all around the world. What the Wynn, MGM, and Caesar have done is they've turned casinos from grimy establishments into grand resorts with something for everyone. It's why people go to Vegas or Macau in the first place, but in order to get people to gamble for more and for longer, you need them to stay for longer. You need good food, good rooms, good entertainment, and a variety of activities for them to do when they're not at the casino. It's an oversimplification to believe that casinos make their money off gambling addicts and shoving slots in people's faces. The Wynn only operates three properties, its flagship in Vegas, a sister property in Macau, and one in the Boston Harbor. The quality of the gambler is what matters most to the Wynn. Their strategy has been to target out-of-town tourists, high rollers, and business executives. Quote, it's always been a truth in our industry that the driver is non-casino attractions. The gambling area is at best the cash register. There is nothing unique about a slot machine or a blackjack table. Every damn slot machine on earth looks like every other one. Every roulette table is identical from one end of the globe to the other. The power rests in the experiential moment that people get when they're in the building. People come to the city to live large. What attracts people is the ambiance, the experience, and not the crap table. People eat, they gamble, they shop, but entertainment matters. The hotel has got to be a show from stem to stern, from top to bottom. In the early days of Vegas, every restaurant and every element of the hotel was adjacent to a slot machine. We know today that it's not necessary to force people to traverse a room full of slots and tables just to go to dinner or a show. I can't stress enough that it's all about who's sitting at a slot or at a table. How else can our 900 slot machines at the Wynn outperform the 2,000 slot machines at the Venetian? I don't trust slots in a box. That's why the Wynn has never done a riverboat or racetrack casino. Our business is having a hotel, a place with a full range of services where even people who don't gamble will go for dinner. The Wynn invests tens of millions of dollars every year, renovating spaces and rearranging equipment to maximize earnings at each of its properties. The MGM and Caesars follows this exact same playbook in regularly updating their restaurants, remodeling rooms, and redesigning floors to earn every dollar possible. MGM owns significantly more properties than the Wynn, including several regional casinos, and Caesars owns the most out of the three. Yet for casinos as proven and reputable as the win, scaling is still difficult. It took the win over 10 years and $250 million just to acquire a gambling license in Massachusetts. The win had to promise politicians that their new casino would contribute significant tax revenue, create thousands of jobs, transform Boston into an international hub, and that the resort would have sufficient non-gambling attractions for locals. It was the same song and dance even 20 years ago in Macau when Wynn first opened up its second property in Asia. Every government in the world wants assurances that the public benefits of a casino will outweigh the cons, and politicians will not hesitate dragging their feet until they feel they have enough guarantees. Quote, Tourism brings people from over there to over here. You build a better place, you employ more people, you pay more taxes, and because fresh money is going from over there to over here, that's steady growth. That's the business that we're in, and that's why we've eschewed going after local markets like Cleveland or Iowa. If we have income from gambling, just like we do in Las Vegas, we can tee up the non-gambling. We can create a grand hotel and have the best hotel room outside of Las Vegas in Boston. 
We'll separate the gambling and put it in a ballroom where you have to go down the hall and through doors. Everyone in Massachusetts can bring their family, their children, and if they hate gambling, if they're repulsed by it, if they have no intention of going near a slot machine, they don't want to hear or see anything, they can enjoy all of our shopping and restaurants with views of the river. The truth is that the Wynn, the MGM, and everyone in this industry would not open up hotels and restaurants without the casinos, and vice versa, and the numbers reflect this reality. Casino revenue, which is the money earned from slots and tables, have contributed the majority of the win's earnings for the past 17 years. The profit margins of the casino business are consistent as the house edge is immune to changes in commodity and labor. It's a bit misleading to look at margins alone without considering the dollar contribution. It would be a mistake to look at these margins and conclude that hotels are more profitable than casinos. For one, the hotel is only in demand because of the casino. Two is that a hotel's capacity is fixed. There are only so many rooms you can turn over in a single night. On a dollar basis, the win grosses two to three times as much from gambling as it does from all its non-gambling businesses combined. This is why casinos openly give away food, drinks, and rooms for free to its high rollers. Historically, the Wynn gives away $200 to $400 million worth of free food, drinks, and rooms every year to its gamblers, which sounds like a lot of money, but when you do the math, that's just 9% of the gambling revenue. As long as the food and lodging keeps people gambling, the win wins every time. It's the same case for the MGM, where even if you include the ticket sales of the world-famous Garden Arena, the casino business contributes more revenue than the hotel rooms, restaurants, bars, retail shops, and events combined. From a dollar standpoint, the casino business generates as much, if not more, revenue than the rest combined. In contrast, Caesars is oriented towards serving everyday locals with over 40 regional casinos around the nation. Regional casinos, in comparison, generally have fewer rooms, less attractions, and significantly more slot machines and tables. Given the gambling first nature of regional casinos, it's no surprise that the overall casino business contributes the vast majority of Caesars' earnings every year. The delta between gambling, food, and hotel is greater for Caesars as regional casinos are simply not the spectacular, all-in-one tourist destinations like the ones you would find on the Strip, nor are they trying to be. Despite serving locals, the profit margins for Caesars casinos are in the same ballpark as the Win and the MGM. The house wins no matter who plays. If we need any more evidence that the restaurants, attractions, hotels, and entertainment only exist to fuel the casino, just take a look at the MGM and the Win post-COVID. Both companies have dramatically slashed profits on their food, drink, and rooms across all their properties just to get the gamblers back in the door, but still maintain the margins on their casino. These industry giants all followed the same playbook, endlessly renovating properties and lobbying states with a 5-10 to 10 year long horizon. In the early 2010s, while these casinos were burying themselves in blueprints and political campaigns, FanDuel and DraftKings appeared on the scene. These two East Coast-based startups had tapped into fantasy sports, an emerging activity that was untouched by traditional regulations. In fantasy sports, you assemble your own team of real-life athletes. Your team earns points based on the actual real-life on-field performance of these same athletes over the course of a season. You pit your team against others, and whoever collects the most points wins. Fantasy sports had existed since the 19th century, but it was at best a niche hobby for sports nerds and diehard fans. In the 2000s, fantasy sports became even more popular as players could ditch the pen and paper for online leagues and automated statistics. With the introduction of the smartphone in the 2010s, FanDuel and DraftKings refined fantasy sports even further by offering short weekly and daily games to better serve players on the go. This helped fantasy sports reach mainstream popularity as the learning curve and the mental commitment to play was dramatically lowered. FanDuel and DraftKings charged players entry fees, they would pool the money together, they would take a cut of the pot like a racetrack or a card room, and then they would pay out the remainder to the winners. Both startups used millions of dollars from venture capital to inflate their prizes, to fund cash bonuses, and to flood sporting events with their advertisements to accelerate user growth. There was no legal or political consensus if fantasy sports was gambling. It was so new that it couldn't be categorized. It wasn't sports betting or commercial gambling. Fantasy sports was essentially legal by omission, and anyone in any state could wager money on DraftKings and FanDuel with just a few taps on their phone. Still, some states like New York, Nevada, and Texas attempted to ban DraftKings and FanDuel out of concern that both startups were not paying the heavy taxes that they should and that daily fantasy sports was the equivalent of gambling. But FanDuel and DraftKings maneuvered around these legal obstacles through appeals and in-house litigation to prolong these judgments and to reach a compromise with those lawmakers, all while growing user interest and player bases. This gray area propelled both companies to billion-dollar valuations in just five years.
By the mid-2010s, DraftKings and FanDuel had each fundraised hundreds of millions of dollars. While both startups were the clear market leaders, they were also completely unsustainable. The fantasy sports market was simply too small and the pots were not big enough to justify their valuations or headcounts. Despite collecting millions of dollars in entry fees, most of the money went to the winners. In 2017, DraftKings grossed $190 million and lost $74 million, which was just the latest loss in company history. DraftKings boasted over half a million monthly active users, who generated on average just $28 in revenue. FanDuel, who was in second place, had equally poor fundamentals, with $124 million in revenue and losses of $44 million. There were two options, to either take a bigger slice of the pot or to pursue fantasy sports in new markets. FanDuel and DraftKings both opted for the latter by diving headfirst into esports and European football, but neither of these ventures predictably brought any lasting success. In 2018, a lifeline materialized out of thin air like divine intervention. The Supreme Court had suddenly repealed a federal law that had banned sports betting everywhere in the U.S. except for a small handful of states like Nevada since the 1990s. It was now up to each state to determine whether or not to legalize sports betting for themselves, which brings us back to the present-day status quo that we covered earlier. Americans no longer needed to travel to Vegas, to the MGM, or to a Native American casino to bet on the Super Bowl. FanDuel and DraftKings quickly pivoted to sports betting as their primary focus, and it was a move that made a ton of sense. FanDuel and DraftKings were household names in American sports, so expanding into the proven, multi-billion dollar sports betting market was a no-brainer. With their existing install bases, mobile-first products, and strong awareness, both startups had a head start that very few old-school casinos or sportsbooks could replicate. Just months after the Supreme Court ruling, FanDuel was acquired by the UK gambling powerhouse Paddy Power Betfair, while DraftKings channeled its momentum into a public listing via SPAC in 2020. Despite all the hype, the online sports betting market in the US was not the slam dunk that both startups had hoped for. The belief at the time was that the Supreme Court's repeal would unlock swift and sweeping legalization of sports betting across all 50 states, it would break Nevada's monopoly, and it would enable DraftKings and FanDuel to monetize all Americans. While some states who were desperate for tax revenue, like New Jersey and West Virginia, moved quickly to legalize sports betting, most states have been slow to act or to extend the same permissions to the online world. As of today, nearly six years after the Supreme Court ruling, sports betting is still illegal in 21 states, or 42% of the country. Some states, like Washington and South Dakota, allow in-person sports betting, but not online sports betting. Every state makes its own rules, and DraftKings and FanDuel have both been forced to continually constrain operations. This had not been an issue before for both startups when they were dealing with fantasy sports, given that it was completely unregulated. Both startups back then had simply slammed the pedal on user growth anywhere and everywhere to try to offset the weak, unproven fundamentals of fantasy sports. Now the problem is reversed. The unit economics in sports betting are proven and stronger than those of fantasy sports. As we mentioned earlier, sportsbooks make money off of each wager like a transaction fee. Their profits depend on volume, as the more bets that are collected and placed, the more the sportsbook can put into its own pocket. But the traditional old-school sportsbooks are typically individual bookies or local retailers who generally take bets from the people in their communities. They never had the technological means or the commercial ambitions like FanDuel and DraftKings to reach an entire population and to generate hundreds of millions of dollars in transaction fees from a single digital storefront. At their core, FanDuel and DraftKings are platforms who live and die based on volume. But due to the ban on online sports betting in over half the country, FanDuel and DraftKings can't hit the critical mass that's needed to improve their bottom line. Instead, their only option is to overcompensate and to milk every dollar they can out of the states that they are allowed to operate in. This means that both companies have naturally fallen back onto the same playbook that they used with fantasy sports. They blow hundreds of millions of dollars every year on bonuses, incentives, and advertisements just to get their existing users to bet at greater amounts and at higher frequencies. We can see this reality in DraftKings numbers, where the top line has grown substantially since the 2018 pivot to sports betting. Yet the startup burns 50 to 80% of every dollar on advertising to maintain user retention and to drive expansion. The losses have only gotten worse even though the player counts have dramatically increased over the years. Everything in America though has a price, and companies with enough cash can solve their problems through lobbying. However, in contrast to the old-school casino giants like the MGM and the Win, FanDuel and DraftKings have little to offer when it comes to winning over politicians.
As online-only businesses, they don't create jobs, they don't elevate the tourism profile of the state, they don't bring outside money in, they don't develop the neighborhood, and they have nothing to reinvest in the local economy. As a result, certain states tend to be less friendly towards FanDuel and DraftKings. Some states like Arizona, Massachusetts, and New Jersey choose to tax online sportsbooks at heavier rates than retail sportsbooks. The most extreme example is New York, who taxes FanDuel, DraftKings, and all online sportsbook operators 50% of gross revenue, while retail sportsbooks only get taxed 10%. And there's nothing FanDuel and DraftKings can do but to shut up and pay because they can't afford to not be in the Big Apple. To complicate matters even further, some states will only issue online sports betting licenses to local brick-and-mortar casinos, even if these old-school businesses have no plans to do anything with it. This means that if FanDuel and DraftKings want to do business in a certain state, they have to get licenses from one of the local casinos. In order to operate in New Jersey, Iowa, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, and Colorado, DraftKings has had to partner with an established casino in each of these states. The casino gives their license to DraftKings in exchange for a slice of every dollar that DraftKings grosses from online sports betting in that entire state. To recap, if we put ourselves in the shoes of DraftKings and FanDuel, the situation is this. Your business is illegal in half the country. The states that do let you operate tax an arm and leg out of your earnings. You have to split what's left with casinos just to maintain access to certain markets. You have to evangelize online sports betting to Americans. You have to maintain your platform. You have to pay licensing fees to the sports leagues and third-party data providers. And your business model still depends on volume. You can't just raise your margins to turn a buck, otherwise your users will leave and just place their bets with another sportsbook, so you have to keep your prices reasonable and in line with the competition in every state. With all this in mind, how much money is really left in your pocket? Fantasy sports was too small of a market. Online sports betting was big enough, but had too many mouths to feed. That left only one option, the casino. As we learned earlier, casinos by design have the house edge, and they have resilient double-digit margins. But more importantly, casinos deal in games of chance and not seasonal games of skill, like fantasy sports and sports betting. There's an inherently addictive quality in casino games that keep the emotions, the money, and customers flowing all year round. For DraftKings and FanDuel, an online casino would be a hedge to sports betting, the same way that sports betting itself had been a hedge to fantasy sports back in 2018. The regulatory obstacles and taxes would be just the same if not worse, as online commercial gambling is far more controversial than sports betting. While sports betting is illegal in nearly half the country, online gambling is illegal in over 35 states or three-fourths of the U.S. Yet the economics of casinos are so proven that even if online casinos were only ever allowed in a few states, DraftKings and FanDuel would make far more money with it than they would not offering it at all. There's data to back this up. When we look abroad in other countries like the UK, Germany, or Australia, where gambling is legalized, open, and mature, the biggest online operators there make most of their money through casinos rather than through sportsbooks. If DraftKings stayed in sports betting, it would be like death by a thousand cuts. Thus, the startup pivoted once again in 2019, throwing everything it had at building an online casino. The company rolled out virtual tables, slots, and custom games that people could play in 30 seconds or less. But DraftKings soon realized that the people who play online casino games are not necessarily the same type of people who go to Vegas and Atlantic City. They weren't going to be poaching gamblers from the Wynn, the MGM, and Caesars. Those players love traveling to gamble. They play for the atmosphere, for the drinks, for the prime rib and lobster, for the pull of the lever and the toss of the chip. All things that no online casino would ever replicate. DraftKings needed to cultivate a new type of gambler. Someone who doesn't normally gamble, who doesn't regularly go to casinos, who doesn't have these ingrained habits or superstitions, but has the time, money, and appetite to play these games for the sake of killing time versus winning big. And by designing these online games to be short, mechanically simple, and mobile first with low bet denominators, players can jump in and play far more rounds with less money and less brain cells than they would have needed in a physical casino. The story that DraftKings and FanDuel all push is that with the right products, they can turn fantasy players into sports bettors and sports bettors into gamblers. Quote, Slider Blackjack is a game that allows you to bet on sports while at the same time playing a blackjack hand. Imagine watching an NFL game and there's a commercial. You can slide up a blackjack hand, play a few hands, slide it down, and then engage with our sportsbook. DraftKings takes the complexity and makes it really easy to play across any product. 
If you're in our daily fantasy sports product, you like the UFC, and you have $20 in your account, we'll recommend a $3 entry contest. We'll engage you with an offer that says McGregor first round knockout because we know that you like UFC and are more likely to bet on that. We make it simple for people by having a shared wallet across these products. They can easily navigate products when in different states using the same account and wallet. Being entertaining, convenient, easy to use, knowing the customer through data science and personalization, giving them the things they want so they don't have to search around, it's about that combination of broad offerings and then well-curated experiences. For the people who are doing it for profit, those are not the kind of players we want. People who are doing it for entertainment are the players that we want. Converting gamblers into sports bettors and vice versa is not something any old school casino has ever actively attempted before, nor did they ever need to. People didn't need to be convinced to gamble. The heavy restrictions simply intensified the demands and all old school casinos had to do was to open up and make people feel comfortable enough to play. The story that FanDuel, DraftKings, and every online casino pushes is that what they're really doing is they're reinventing gambling as a product and creating a new type of gambler. Their focus is on developing these new, exclusive, proprietary online games that are so addicting and convenient that they'll bring in a new type of gambler, someone who's chronically online, who values speed and convenience over ambiance and atmosphere, and prefers these virtual venues over traditional casinos. Once these startups develop the right products and they hone in on this new market, the remaining states will have opened up and they'll no longer need to burn as much money on advertising and marketing. And all these startups pitch that they'll net greater profits in the long run because they won't ever need to spend billions of dollars like the Wynn or the MGM on luxury hotels, fancy restaurants, free drinks, and flashy shows just to lure players in the door. This is why it's impossible to make sense of DraftKings or FanDuel without first understanding the regulatory environment and the old school casinos. If you look at just the finances of DraftKings and FanDuel, their financials are filled with undisclosed metrics and endless pontification that what they're doing is so unique that they cannot be compared to the traditional casino or sportsbook. In contrast, the Wynn, MGM, and Caesars all disclose how much money gamblers are putting in their slots and table games every year down to the exact dollar. They even go so far as to share their exact win rates across the various types of games and properties. DraftKings and FanDuel refuse to disclose anything remotely useful, with zero mention of deposits, how much of the pots they rake for fantasy, the average bet size in their sportsbook, the hold rates in their casinos, and so on. Both startups even go so far as to disguise all their revenue streams together as one single total, asserting that it's not helpful to see how much money they make in online casinos versus fantasy sports versus sports betting. DraftKings instead walks and talks like a SaaS company by constantly defining everything in terms of CAC, LTV, users, average revenue, cohorts, churns, and payback periods. DraftKings and FanDuel generate hundreds of slides and literature every year explaining how you as the public should value their potential and this new market while bearing their present-day fundamentals until the very end. While DraftKings and FanDuel pitch that they're cultivating this new generation of mobile-first, chronically online gamblers, the reality is that the old-school casinos like the Wynn and the MGM don't really know if these startups are just bluffing. Rather than folding and missing out on the pot entirely, the casino giants have instead chosen to check by investing millions of dollars to roll out their own online sportsbooks and casinos. While DraftKings and FanDuel are betting on change, these old-school casinos are betting on legacy and that their offline brand and prestige will carry over into the virtual world. MGM was the earliest, in 2018, launching BetMGM, their own online sportsbook and casino. Wynn launched WinBet in 2021, asserting that the slow nationwide legalization was actually a net positive and that concentrating on just a few states at a time would give them the space to build up their talent and product. And Caesars followed suit in 2022 with its own digital sportsbook and then an online casino in 2023. While user acquisition has been the most expensive part of the equation for online-only operators, old-school casinos have the edge in awareness, reach, and customer base. Instead of trying to create a new market, these giants have all found stronger product market fit using their virtual properties as the centerpiece of an omni-channel strategy. They all have four goals with their online casinos. One is to further monetize the high rollers when they're not physically at the property. Two is to ramp up the casual novice who's just starting out their gambling journey online where the stakes are much smaller and the atmosphere is less intimidating. Three is to reward their collective engagement with offline benefits. And four is to gradually convert these online whales into real high rollers at the physical casino. Quote, BetMGM has the backing of the MGM brand, 
a strong community presence, and market access in states where MGM has a physical property. It's going to be a long battle. There's probably 15 online operators now in the US, give or take, and I think there'll probably be three or four that truly succeed. The rest will disappear or get gobbled up. Sports betting penetration has a long way to go before it becomes a mainstream leisure pursuit. Our national brand awareness makes BetMGM the obvious choice. We have sports books and MGM properties where customers can engage with our staff who can provide betting assistance as well as help them sign up and fund their digital accounts. People that play in BetMGM want to come to Las Vegas. BetMGM customers receive preferential service while on MGM properties, including faster check-in, access to premium entertainment, and discounted room rates. BetMGM provides an opportunity for us to educate customers that might be new to betting as well as recruit high-value players from these digital venues into retail venues. The ROI of our omni-channel is 6.5 times better than our other marketing channels. What we've seen is that digital players like faster gameplay. As players journey from the casino and into online, they will often start with the product that they know. I played this game in the casino, let me play the same game and table at home. The role of Vegas in player acquisition and retention is important for us because these players we acquire in Vegas don't live in Vegas, so they're taking BetMGM home with them. For each major casino, these virtual properties are strategic revenue streams with the goal of ultimately feeding the core brick-and-mortar casino business. In this regard, the online casino is not substantially any different from the hotel room, the restaurants, the bars, and the entertainment. As a result, these old-school casinos have no problems admitting they don't know what they don't know. Quote, we thought we had a significant advantage with our Caesars Rewards database of 65 million people. We had ground to make up. We had to launch an app. Our thesis was that we had already identified a lot of the most valuable gamblers out there, and our job was to convert them into our digital business. We expect the digital business to help us drive incremental value, and that the customers that we've sourced in digital will show up in our brick-and-mortar casinos. Our ability to succeed from here, in my view, is dependent on our ability to target these valuable customers, to service them in digital, and then roll them into Caesars Rewards and into our larger brick-and-mortar business. Since the Wynn, the MGM, and Caesars are not banking on virtual casinos to turn massive profits in the same way that DraftKings and FanDuel are, they can afford to subsidize these digital venues in order to foster more whales. The hold rate is the percentage of gambled money that the casino keeps as its earnings. In Caesars Online Casino, the hold rate is significantly lower than any hold rate of a brick-and-mortar casino. The Win, for example, has an average hold rate of 7% on slots on its Vegas properties, which means that when players sit down, for every $100 they feed into the slot machine, they should expect to lose $7 on average. At a table game, the average hold rate is 23%, meaning that for every $100 wagered, a player should expect to lose $23. For MGM and Caesar, their slots and tables are marginally less player-friendly. But if we look at Caesar's online casino, the hold rate there is just 3% across both digital table games and slots meaning that players are currently losing significantly less money online than they would have in person. And this is all intentional. But DraftKings and FanDuel aren't going down without a fight, as both startups have responded to the greater competition by burning even greater amounts on advertising and marketing. As the stakes have gotten higher, some of the old-school casinos like the Win have folded, with the belief that the juice is simply not worth the squeeze. Quote, while sports betting will potentially be a 30 to $40 billion market over time, the marketplace is proving to be very competitive, with multiple operators deploying marketing dollars, driving high cost per acquisition, and significant bonus offers. In light of this dynamic, we are intentionally pivoting our approach to scaling and taking a more measured, long-term focus to grow a healthy and sustainable business. We've decided to rationalize our online business by exiting New York and Michigan and to primarily focus on Massachusetts and Nevada, the states where we do have a physical presence. The online business is really a business of building player cohorts. Every day we're out acquiring customers. We build these player cohorts. These player cohorts age out over time and deliver EBITDA. The next step for us, in light of uncertainty in the market with respect to user acquisition behavior, is to get to the EBITDA break-even point. Yet there is some merit and data to back up FanDuel and DraftKings argument that if you are able to develop the right product, you can spur on this customer change and open up this new market. In recent years, FanDuel and DraftKings have evolved sports betting as a product into a faster, more attractive and engaging format with parlays. With parlays, you stack multiple bets into a single bet. Instead of just betting on one winner in a single matchup, you can bet on multiple matchups at one time, like having one team winning their game and another team losing theirs. With parlays, you can stack as many of these small bets as you want across multiple sports or even player performance, and the more bets in your parlay, the greater your payout. 
This gives bettors the opportunity to win big, but the risk is also much greater because you need to win every single bet to win the parlay. Parlays have become extremely popular amongst bettors because of how little they need to put in for the chance to win big, and they're also far more profitable for the sportsbooks because of how much more likely bettors are to lose playing parlays in the first place. But when you talk to people who play parlays, they don't see themselves as gamblers, just sports bettors. Quote, if somebody does a very large parlay with lots of legs, they have an opportunity to turn a very small bet into a large payday. My belief is that the US consumer and the gambling market, a lot of the roots are in lotteries, where there have been more lotteries across states for a lot longer than there have been casinos and other gambling products. And that lottery mentality of big jackpots has carried over. Parlays have more upsides in the US market than they would in other parts of the world, but I think the US customer is uniquely oriented towards this kind of proposition, where you bet a little to win a lot. DraftKings has only ventured even deeper into the online casino business. In 2022, they bought Golden Nugget Online for $1.5 billion, a valuation of 13 times revenue. Looking at Golden Nugget Online's financials, we can see once again the advantages of old school casinos. Golden Nugget Online had been consistently profitable with comparable operating margins to traditional brick and mortar casinos. And while DraftKings was burning 50 to 80% of its revenue every year on customer acquisition, Golden Nugget Online had spent just 15 to 20%. Golden Nugget had been in business decades before their online venture, and they had amassed a huge database of customers over the past 70 years. They simply pushed their existing customers into this new online venue, they took wagers from sports bettors, and they offered slots and tables to the gamblers. Even DraftKings had to admit that capturing market share had not been as straightforward as they had hoped, there were aspects to branding that they could not replicate online, and that having more casino players in general is crucial for their business, even if they don't ultimately convert to sports bettors or to fantasy. Quote, Golden Nugget has a great brand that reaches a very different type of customer in the online gambling space than what DraftKings reaches. The conclusion that we came to was that DraftKings is really a sports brand, and for the right customers, the ones that are into sports, we are doing a great job of being able to keep them on the platform and to cross-sell them into our online casino. We got the top 1, 2, and 3 position in every market that we're in for online gambling based almost primarily on cross-sell, but we were missing a good chunk of the audience. We estimate about 70% of the audience is not coming to DraftKings because of the brand issue. Moving forward, we'll position DraftKings as a sports-led brand with online gambling cross-sell, and Golden Nugget as an online gambling brand with sports cross-sell. If the numbers that were just said don't make sense, that's because they don't. That's the state of the online gambling and sportsbook market today. It's a wild west where every company claims to have the leading market share, the best products, the fastest growth, the shortest payback periods, and the highest customer satisfaction based on vague third-party surveys and selective data. There's no consensus and no basis for truth because everyone is disclosing as little or as much as they want. And until sports betting and online gambling are legalized in all 50 states, anyone and everyone will invent whatever story they want about market potential and consumer change. If you believe the online operators like DraftKings and FanDuel, then you're subscribing to the belief that there is a new emerging generation of players who will prefer gambling online over in person and will one day see sports betting, fantasy sports, and gambling all at the same level of risk. If you believe the old school casinos, then you're subscribing to the belief that online gambling and in-person gambling are the exact same thing. Online casinos are just an extension of an existing brand and business. You're free to gamble virtually if it's more convenient, but the best product and experience will always be in the casino. Ultimately, the thing to consider is not whether or not DraftKings or FanDuel will be profitable, but rather the social ramifications of these collective industry efforts. Is gambling inherently more addictive and more dangerous when the game is made more convenient, accessible, and fast-paced? Is there any real difference between losing $100 in chips and cash playing 15 minutes of blackjack on a physical table or losing $100 virtually over three hours of online blackjack? And is gambling safer when people are forced to play in person behind closed doors at exclusive hard-to-access isolated venues? Or is gambling more of a vice when it's available as on-demand digital entertainment in the palm of your hand? For an ambitious yet unprofitable startup like DraftKings, whose runway is getting shorter by the month, how far would they be willing to go to push the boundaries between ethics and engagement, between what's right and what sells, just to maintain their growth and valuation?